Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. I'm so glad we could shoehorn you all in here. Uh, I guess we'll have to move to the Coliseum next time. <laughs> I'm delighted to welcome you to our Independent Policy Forum this evening. As some of you are, who have been here before know, the Independent Policy Forum is a regular series of lectures, seminars, and debates that we conduct uh, here in the Bay Area, and especially here at our conference center in Oakland. Our program today is entitled, The Real Abraham Lincoln, A Debate. We're featuring the books, A New Birth of Freedom by Harry Jaffa, which is, I'd say, one of the most important books done on Lincoln. Uh, and those of you who know about Harry Jaffa's work will understand what I mean. The second book that we're featuring is the book called The Real Lincoln by Tom DiLorenzo, which is a challenge to many traditional views of Lincoln. As many of you know, the Independent Institute regularly holds programs like this. Uh, we're also very grateful when we do that um, Robert Mondavi Winery is very kind to donate the wine that we enjoy. For those of you who are new to the Institute, in the registration packet, you'll find information about our program. The Independent Institute is a public policy research institute. We organize many conference and media programs. We sp sponsor many studies on major public policy research areas and economic and social issues. On our homepage, you can also listen to many of the transcripts and listen to many of the events from past Institute <coughs> events. One of our publications is the quarterly journal called The Independent Review. This is the current issue. Uh, the cover story is on the coming destruction of medical privacy in the United States. Also in your program, you'll in your packet, you'll find information about uh, tonight's program, as well as a notice of our next event, which is going to be scheduled on June 6th is called Big Brother is Watching. The speaker will be James Bamford, who's currently a dis distinguished visiting faculty member at the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley, and author of the new book Body of Secrets, Anatomy of the Ultra Secret National Security Agency. Many of you may be familiar with his earlier book called Puzzle Palace, also on the NSA, which broke a great deal of ground and surprised many people who didn't even know that the NSA existed. Also, you'll find in your packet information about our summer seminars for high school and college students. This year, we're holding two seminars. <coughs> They're being co-sponsored with Holy Names College here in Oakland. The dates for those programs are July tw uh, 17th to the 21st. Oh, I'm sorry, June 17th to the 21st. Carl Close is our academic affairs director. And also August 12th to the 16th. And um, students who participate can also earn a one-hour college course credit in economics. And um, we hope that if you know young people, that you'll steer them that way. For this evening, uh, we're quite pleased to have two top figures um, who will be discussing one of the most revered and derided figures in American history. Our program features two scholars who will discuss their books and differing views. The um, topic of tonight's program, actually I didn't get a chance to tell you, but I thought we should change it uh, based on some new research that's just come out. The Weekly World News has just announced that Abraham Lincoln was a woman. And I'm not sure if you've seen this research yet. <laughs> the significance of this is that Abraham Lincoln is one of the seminal figures in American history. And a popular publication like this can make uh, mockery of him and issues, and it doesn't really affect uh, the legacy and the ideas and the controversy that surrounds him. Most Americans, in fact, consider Abraham Lincoln to be the greatest president in history. His legend as a great emancipator has grown to 
almost mythic proportions as hundreds of books, as well as the, the Lincoln Monument in Washington, D.C., extol his heroism and so forth. The question is, is Lincoln's reputation deserved? In his book, Lincoln scholar Harry Jaffa argues that Lincoln was a model statesman who stuck by high-minded principles as he fought to promote liberty. Lincoln critic Tom DiLorenzo argues that Lincoln was a calculating politician who waged the bloodiest war in American history, not to free the slaves, but in order to build an empire. Was Lincoln a great hero, or a villain, or both? Did, the honor, did he honor the promise of America, or did he betray it? So we're delighted to have these two scholars here with us. The format we thought we would use for the debate is that each of our speakers will speak for 30 minutes followed by a five-minute response, and then we'll open it up to questions from you and the audience. We also ask that the debate <coughs> remain gentlemanly. No kicking, biting, spitting. <laughs> Harry has been here before. <laughs> Our program is a battle of ideas, and it's between two men, marks on the other. two men of goodwill, who incidentally both share the abolitionist tradition of ending slavery. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker. I'm very pleased to introduce Harry V. Jaffa. Harry is the Henry Salvatore Professor of Political Philosophy Emeritus at Claremont McKenna College and Claremont Graduate University. He received his PhD from the New School for Social Research. He's been a fellow of the Ford, Rockefeller, Guggenheim, and Earhart Foundations. In addition to his most recent book, A New Birth of Freedom. He's the author of the uh, most widely, perhaps the most influential single book on Lincoln and the Lincoln-Douglas debate called The Crisis of the House Divided. His other books include Equality and Liberty, The Conditions of Liberty, of Freedom, Storm Over the Constitution, uh, Thomism and Aristotelianism, and many others. It's a great pleasure to introduce Harry Jaffa. On, on the question of the gentle, gentlemanliness of the debate, I'm reminded uh, in the uh, Congress before, just before the Civil War, uh, the uh, senator from, Massachusetts, from New Hampshire, I think, made an anti-slavery speech. And the senator from Mississippi, not uh, Jefferson Davis, uh, invited him to come down to Mississippi to make that speech, promising to see that he was hanged from the highest tree in the in the forest. Uh, the senator from, uh, from New Hampshire uh, invited the senator from Mississippi to come to New Hampshire where he would be given a respectful hearing in every township in that state. Uh, when, when people speak about the, uh, re the results of the 1860 presidential election, the, the vote, for example, it's usually given out that Lincoln had, I think, 39% of the popular vote in that election. But of course, there were 10 states uh, in the South who formed part of the, the 10 of the 11 states of the Confederacy in which no Republican electors were on the ballots. Uh, and since we know that at least 100,000 men from those states came north to, to join the Union Army, there were at least 100,000 votes that weren't counted, you see. Uh, but the, the, the South became a closed society uh, on the eve of the Civil War. And it became a closed society after the end of Reconstruction. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, yes, uh, the uh, Intercollegiate Studies Institute for some time circulated a book uh, edited by my late friend Mel Bradford, the essays of Andrew Lytell, who was one of the Southerners who took my who took their stand in 1931, I think it was, and one of those essays written in 1934 praised lynching as a legitimate exercise of the reserved powers of the states when the government didn't fulfill their duty in uh, taking care of uh, of racist agitators. So the South was a closed society on the subject of race 
right up until World War II. Uh, and <clears throat> the, uh, Lincoln in his, uh, in the, the uh, Cooper Union speech, which he gave in February of 1860, uh, raised the question, what can, we, what can we do to satisfy our Southern brethren? Uh, no, no assurances that we give them that we will have no intention of interfering with the institution, institution of slavery where it exists will satisfy them. We must uh, get rid of all, all anti-slavery sentiments from our state constitutions. And I should mention, by the way, that President Buchanan, in his last uh, in his December speech, a State of the Union speech, December 1860, uh, said that unless the Northern states, and there were eight of them that had, that had uh, uh, laws uh, trying to, to protect uh, black people who were free from being uh, uh, kidnapped as slaves because under the, the law of 1850, the, slave, the Fugitive Slave Act, if a, if a Southerner came, came across from Virginia into Pennsylvania, and saw a black man that he thought he would like to have as a slave, he had to say, well, that's my runaway slave. And this runaway slave was, would then be arrested and confined, and then there would be a hearing before a federal commissioner. Uh, and the, the uh, would-be slave owner uh, could uh, summon witnesses, as many as he wanted. The man accused of being a slave could summon no witnesses, had no counsel. And if the federal commissioner decided he was a slave, he was paid $10. And if he decided he was a free man, he was paid $5. It's hard to imagine any law passed that either Nazi Germany or Stalin's Russia, which was more inconsistent with the principles of civil liberty uh, than the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, Lincoln, as we know, supported that act as part of the Compromise of 1850. But in his inaugural address, he mentioned several respects in which that law should be modified so that it would be consistent at least with the, with the principles of civil liberty. Uh, but that was the temper of the, uh, of the country and the, and, the, and the different relationship between them towards the, attitude, uh, towards the institution of slavery. Uh, now my friend uh, Tom DiLorenzo here thinks that slavery was not the real issue in the Civil War, that it was the, it was the Whig economic program tariffs, in, banks, tariffs, internal improvements, and what he calls corporate welfare. <laughs> that, it's, uh, and he thinks that the, the slavery question was, was really only a, a sham, which uh, was not the real, the real question, it was not the real thing at issue between the, the sections. Well, it's very strange for anybody reading the Lincoln-Douglas debates to find that the subject of tariffs is never mentioned. Uh, the only time the word is used, I think, is when, when, when Douglas says that the tariff was one of the questions that the, s the two parties used to discuss, but the only subject discussed in the Lincoln-Douglas debates was slavery in the territories. And it's important to understand the sequence of events and the ideas that accompanied that, that sequence of events that led up to the Civil War. And the subtitle of my new book is Abraham Lincoln and the Coming of the Civil War. And I believe I've discussed the question of the, of the, of the nature of secession and the role of secession in that crisis, I believe, more thoroughly than I think has ever been discussed before. Uh, Tom DiLorenzo, in his book, thinks that, that, the, that, the, that the right of secession is, and the right of revolution, that that's a semantic difference. Well. It was not a semantic difference. It was a fundamental difference. Uh, the right of revolution is referred to in the Declaration of Independence when it says that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, meaning the security of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, the people have a right to alter or abolish it and institute new government, such as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. That is, is what has been referred to ever since as the right of revolution. It's the right to resist intolerable oppression. It's the right to prevent uh, anyone from being reduced under absolute despotism, which is what the Declaration of Independence says. Uh, and this declaration gives a long catalog 
of the abuses and usurpations of power practiced by the King and Parliament of Great Britain, which justified the colonies in their rebellion. See, uh, the, the colonists did not, at this point, claim any privileges under the law of Great Britain. They were breaking from the law of Great Britain. They were appealing instead to the laws of nature and of nature's God. And it was under those laws that they had the right to resist oppression. Uh, in, in 1860, the South did not appeal to the right of revolution. They appealed to a right of secession, which they claimed to be a, a, a constitutional right under the Constitution itself. See, uh, in, 18, in 1776, the colonists did not <clears throat> uh, claim that in, in breaking with Great Britain, they were exercising a right granted by the British Constitution. They had conducted their struggle until that moment by appealing to the British Constitution, but when they decided on independence, they appealed instead to the laws of nature and of nature's God. Uh, now, there were many reasons why the South did not appeal to the right of revolution. Uh, one reason was because they had no catechal, there were, there were no abuses which they'd been subject to which uh, comparable to the ones enumerated in the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln, in his inaugural address, uh, said that, that there was not a single constitutional right which anybody could point to, to say that that had been violated. Uh, they, they were exercising this right as something that was to their pleasure, for their own purposes, but they had nothing to do with, with the Constitution and yet they were claiming it as a constitutional right to withdraw uh, from the Union. Now, the issue of the Civil War, as Lincoln presented it in both his uh, uh, inaugural address on March 4th and, his, and in the message to Congress in special session on July 4th, four months later, was in essence this. Uh, if if a, uh, a minority well, let me start again. In, in ratifying the Constitution, each state had committed itself to, the, to accepting the results of elections conducted under the rules of the Constitution. The election of 1860 had been conducted under the rules of the Constitution. If there were any violations of those rules, it was by the southern states in refusing to allow Republican electors on the ballot. But there was nothing which the Republican Party had done. There was nothing in the electoral pro procedures of the free states, or for that matter of the slave states with this exception, which justified uh, anyone in saying that the, that the results of this election were not constitutional results. If a minority losing an election can break up the government rather than accept the results of the election, free government is impossible. Uh, if the only alternatives to, uh, to rule by a constitutional majority, I say constitutional majority, a majority formed under the rules of the Constitution with minority rights secured, there was, there were, there were no examples of the Republicans doing anything to prevent the opposition from having freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of association. There was a great deal of interference with those rights in the southern states. But they lost the election according to their own lights. Uh, and, and, they, and Lincoln said that if, if people can break up the government rather than accept the results of a, of, a, of, a, of a fairly conducted election, then the only alternatives are anarchy or tyranny. See? What is to prevent, he said, any one of the states seceding from, seceding from the, any future union? Uh, so that was the, the, the basic issue, that, that once the ballots have decided, like it said, the only recourse must be to future elections in which the minority can try to become the majority. But there can be no right to reject the results of an election conducted under the rules of the Constitution. Uh, now, let us trace, for, let me trace for a moment the sequence of events that led up to the secession crisis. Uh, the, I'll begin by saying that 
the decisive act of secession, the secession which caused all future secession was not what happened after Lincoln's election. It was the secession of the seven states of the Deep South from the Democratic Convention in Charleston of 1860. As far as I know, Mr. DiLorenzo doesn't even know anything about this. He can still comment on it when he wants to. Uh, but what happened then? A majority of the delegates to that convention wanted to nominate Stephen A. Douglas as the Democratic candidate for presidency. The Democratic Party had the two-thirds rule, which they continued to have until 1936, as a matter of fact. I think only in 36 did they change it to the simple majority. Franklin D. Roosevelt's first nomination had to be two-thirds. The, the uh, seven states of the Deep South, the same seven states that seceded uh, after Lincoln's election and before his inauguration, <coughs> demanded as a plank in the Democratic platform without which they would not support Douglas. A slave code for the territories. Uh, now there's a little story to that. Uh, <coughs> Chief Justice Tawney in the Dred Scott decision had said that the only, he, uh, the Dred Scott decision which said that the Missouri Compromise restriction of slavery in 1820 and any other one was unconstitutional, that there was no power in the Congress to forbid slavery in the territories. Then he added, as a kind of obiter dictum, that the only power of Congress over slavery in the territories was the power coupled with the duty of protecting the owner and his rights. Now, the seven states of the Deep South interpreted that to mean that the police power of the federal government had to guarantee the integrity of the property of any slave owner going into any United States territory. Uh, this, by the way, was a demand for a, the greatest increase of federal power uh, prior to the New Deal, maybe even since the New Deal. The greatest demand for an increase in federal power was made by the southern states uh, in, in, in 1860. And, they, and when, the, and when the, uh, the majority in the convention refused to adopt this, and they refused to adopt it because nobody could be elected dog catcher uh, in the free state who supported a federal uh, police power over slavery in the territories. But remember, bear this in mind, this demand meant, if this demand had been acceded to, that meant that every territory in the United States, which would become a state, and remember where there were then 33 states and there would be 50 states eventually, but every other state would become a slave state. Because if one slave owner went to North Dakota with his slave, uh, the, the, the federal police power would follow him to make sure that he could hold that slave securely in that place. Now, this was, this was a demand for the indefinite extension of slavery. So the choice between the, facing the country was, was whether slavery will be restricted or whether it will be extended indefinitely with the whole power of the federal government behind the extension of slavery. And what this could mean is illustrated by what happened in 1854. The first real test of the, slave, of the Fugitive Slave Act, there was a, a slave named Anthony Burns in Virginia who, 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 who uh, stowed away on board a coastal vessel which uh, then sailed to Boston. And Anthony Burns, who was apparently quite literate but not very smart, wrote a letter to his brother back in Virginia telling him where he was. <laughs> well, before, before Anthony Burns was returned to the state of Virginia, the, uh, the president, Franklin Pierce, had uh, sent a regiment, an, an artillery regiment of Marines to Boston. He had federalized the, the National Guard of the state of Boston. He had 3,000 soldiers surrounding them, making sure that nobody could uh, could break the jail and let Anthony Burns out. This was a, an example of the way in which the, f the federal police power would be used to make sure that slaves were returned to their masters or that slaves couldn't escape from their masters. So this is the real issue. Now, 
why was, what was Douglas's position? Uh, Douglas, was, uh, Douglas was the man who, who in 1854, in, in uh, drafting and sponsoring the Kansas-Nebraska Act, had moved for the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. So the, 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 the Missouri Compromise restriction on slavery, and that meant that uh, after Missouri was, entered, was admitted to the Union in 1820 or 21, uh, the Congress resolved that in all the remaining territory north of 3630, which was the southern boundary of Missouri, that, that all the remaining territory would be forever free. That meant that the states of uh, Kansas, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, and parts of Colorado and Wyoming were, were uh, uh, slavery was excluded from them. Uh, and that, so the repeal of the, of the Missouri Compromise opened that whole territory to the ingress of slavery. That sparked the greatest political revolution in American history. Uh, in, 18, in the spring of 1854, when the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed, there was no Republican Party. There were no Republican congressmen. In the fall elections of 1854, 100 co Republican congressmen were returned to the Congress. Uh, at that moment, Stephen A. Douglas was looked upon as the Antichrist from the point of view of the anti-slavery movement. Three years later, in the contest for Kansas, when the administration, headed by James Buchanan now, tried to railroad through a constitution called the Lecompton Constitution, which would have made Kansas a slave state, uh, but on the basis of a phony vote, Douglas sticking to his popular sovereignty doctrine, which meant that the people of the territory in a fair vote would decide for or against slavery. That was his what, the way in which he replaced the Missouri Compromise restriction. It opened slavery, but it said that, that the decision in any, each territory would be made by the people in that territory uh, on the basis of their preferences. Well, the, uh, the, the uh, administration uh, led by Buchanan, who came from Pennsylvania, but was one of the famous doe-faced presidents, that's I mean, a northern man with southern principles, uh, that uh, uh, Douglas became the leader of the Republicans in the struggle in Congress to, uh, to uh, defeat the Lecompton Constitution. And he succeeded. And from becoming the antichrist of the, of the, of the anti-slavery movement, he became the savior. And many people in the Republican Party wanted uh, the, uh, the Lincoln and the Republicans in Illinois to support Douglas for re-election. That was a decisive moment in Lincoln's career, and that's, that's what he, the situation he faced when he got up to give his House Divided speech in June, June 16th of 1858. It was a crisis of his own career. It was also, in my opinion, the gravest crisis this country has ever faced, because the greatest danger to the future of the country came not, uh, I think, from the pro-slavery argument, but from the morally neutral argument uh, of Douglas. And that's a long story, and you'll find it all spelled out in great detail in my book, which I hope you will read with great care. <laughs> but this, but in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, Lincoln accomplished something almost miraculous. That is to say, he had to, what he had to do was to fight off the challenge of Douglas from the Republican side, and at the same time, drive a wedge between Douglas and the Southern Democrats. Uh, I compared his achievement in that to, to Stonewall Jackson's Valley Campaign, where, where Jackson uh, fought two federal armies, beat them both, and led, kept them close to Washington. Well, he joined Lee before Richmond for the final battle of the seven days. Uh, it was, uh, it was a, ca a case of tactical and strategic cleverness and profundity which is unrivaled in, Ameri in, I think, almost perhaps in world history. Lincoln's last words in the Lincoln-Douglas debates were, he challenged uh, Douglas, uh, Douglas accepted Dred Scott. That, in, in Dred Scott, the, the Chief Justice had said that, that the right to own slaves is expressly affirmed in the Constitution. Uh, and Lincoln said it's, it was implied, but not expressly affirmed. 
the argument against any restriction on slavery was that any right expressly affirmed in the, if affirmed in the Constitution takes precedence of any law or regulation in any jurisdiction, whatever. Remember the the uh, supremacy clause in Article Six of the Constitution says that this Constitution and the laws and treaties made in pursuance thereof are the supreme law of the land. Anything in any law or constitution of any state to the contrary notwithstanding, see. Uh, and Lincoln pointed out that this argument, which the court applied to the territories, could also equally well be applied to the states. Uh, so that the, pros the prospect of, of slavery becoming national, not only through the spread into the new territories, but, it, but, but in the s spread to the states, uh, was very great. This was, this was Lincoln's argument. Now, Lincoln said to Douglas, if you say, if you accept Tony's opinion that the, that the law, that, the, uh, uh, that slavery is expressly affirmed in the Constitution is true, then you are under an obligation to give the slave owners the rights, to the, uh, the, the implementation of this right. Uh, a parallel case, of the parallel example was the Fugitive Slave Act. The, Article 4 of the Constitution says any person held to service or labor in any state escaping uh, to another state shall not be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be returned to the one to whom the service or labor is due. This is the favor fugitive slave clause of the Constitution. Now, the, the clause of the Constitution doesn't say how this right is to be enforced, but it says it shall be done. Uh, and from 1793 to 1850, uh, this was left to the to the interstate comedy that depended upon the states honoring the the, the uh, act. Well, that was not working, and so they this federal level, this federal law was substituted, which gave, provided enforcement procedures under the auspices of the uh, uh, of the federal government. And Lincoln said. If you believe that, that, that in the Future of Slave Act being required by Article 4, you must also believe that the, uh, that, the, uh, that the protection of the slave owner in the territories deserves federal protection. The two arguments were perfectly parallel. And when Douglas denied, see, see Douglas said it didn't matter how the how the Supreme Court in the abstract decided the question of slavery in the territories. If the slave owner went to the territory, he had to get local regulations to, uh, to protect his property. And Lincoln was said, said that by your own argument, if the local regulations are not forthcoming, you must support the uh, federal enforcement. If you don't, you're taking the same position as the abolitionists who denied any obligation to enforce the fugitive slave law. His last, Lincoln's last words is, in the Lincoln-Douglas debates were, why there's not such an abolitionist as Senator Douglas after all, see? Well, this may have, it's not clear how persuasive this argument was in Illinois, but it was very persuasive in Mississippi and Alabama and Florida and South Carolina, who said, well, Lincoln's right, this son of a, Pardon me, this man, Douglas, <laughs> is denying us our constitutional rights. See, uh, and as a result of that, it, it was Lincoln's cleverness in the debates which split the Democratic Convention in Charleston in April 1860. And this is what, in fact, elected Abraham Lincoln. But it was the rebellion against Douglas, not against Lincoln, see, which precipitated the whole secessionist movement. They would not accept and, and the South, it's been well said and about many people in many circumstances that whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. These people in the Deep South were mad because they could have elected Douglas and Douglas would have given them everything they wanted, you see. Uh, everything that, that, that they wanted that was consistent with his election in the, in the free states, you see. Douglas was a radical expansionist. Uh, both, both parts of the Democratic Party in 1860 called for the annexation of Cuba. And there were 100, and there were 100,000 slaves in Cuba. And Cuba was the place that slaves were still being brought from Africa and then <laughs> resold in the United States. So it was, uh, 
and, and, and under Douglas, uh, Douglas presidency, we would have taken over the rest of Mexico and, and Central America whenever we had the, the resources and the appetite to take to do so. Uh, and Douglas didn't believe didn't believe in inferior races. You can be sure that the, most of the Mexicans would have either been reduced to peonage or to slavery, uh, because. And in the Mexican War itself, in case you don't know it, we uh, we appropriated 60 percent of the land area which, of the of Mexico as it was then defined through the Spanish conquests. So uh, we increased the size of the United States by 40 percent and reduced <laughs> Mexico by 60 percent. Uh, and, and so the appetite for, for slavery expansion was, and the possibilities were almost endless. And Douglas would have done these things, but he couldn't subscribe to the slave code. Uh, and on that, ba on that basis, they, they seceded, and that split the Democratic Party, and that elected Abraham Lincoln. Uh, now, uh, Lincoln's position was consistent throughout the debates. Uh, a great deal is said, Dr. Lorenzo says it, but it's been said countless times before that uh, Lincoln used racist language in the debates. That's not true. Uh, what Lincoln said was that he, what he argued for in the debates was a recognition of the natural rights of black people. When Douglas said that if the people of Nebraska are good enough to govern themselves, they certainly are good enough to govern a few miserable Negroes. And Lincoln replied by saying, I doubt not that the people of Nebraska are as good as the average of people elsewhere. What I say is that no man is good enough to govern another without his consent. That was the line he took. And he, he did not try to settle the matter of what would be done if universal emancipation came. No intelligent politician tries to raise questions which will divide his followers. He tries to use, take positions which will unite his followers. And Lincoln did the best that anybody could have possibly done to unite his followers on questions of principle, which applied directly to the, the great issue of public policy, which at that time was slavery in the territories. Well, I think my time is up, so. Thank you very much, Harry. Our next speaker is Thomas DiLorenzo. Tom is professor of economics in the Selinger School of Business and Management at Loyola College in Maryland. He was also a Garvey Fellow, a program that the Institute runs for uh, graduate students and junior faculty members. He holds a PhD in economics from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, and he has taught at George Mason University, Washington University, State University of New York at Buffalo, and the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. In addition to The Real Lincoln, his other books include Underground Government, Destroying Democracy, Official Lies, and Public Health Profiteering. Professor DiLorenzo has published over 70 articles in various scholarly journals, especially in the field of economics, and he has widely published in popular publications such as the Wall Street Journal and others. I'm very pleased to introduce Tom DiLorenzo. David. <clears throat> I wish I'm, uh, I hope I'm half as bright as Harry when I'm his age. He's got three or four years on me, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I hope when I'm his age, I'm still standing up here giving very articulate and brilliant speeches like he does. And, and I certainly agree with him on Lincoln on when he, uh, cleverness and profundity. It's kind of pathetic that in my lifetime, I think of the best politician as a politician is Bill Clinton. <laughs> I, I, I despise Bill Clinton, but as a politician, he's the best. And to compare, you know, and when I think back of Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, brilliant man, cleverness, profundity, is right. You read Lincoln's speeches, then read Bill Clinton's speeches, and, and it's just horrible, but, uh, but that's what we live with today. Uh, I'm going to tell a slightly different story uh, about, about Lincoln, and I call him in my book the uh, political son of Alexander Hamilton because uh, for most of his uh, career prior to becoming president, he was a Whig uh, and, uh, and he was an ardent follower, ard ardent promoter of the Whig economic agenda. And from the time of the founding of the Republic, uh, and certainly until uh, you know, the war, um, there was the big debate between the Jeffersonians and Hamiltonians. Uh, Hamilton wanted a much more highly centralized state. 
Uh, for what? Uh, well, primarily for, uh, uh, for economic planning. Uh, he was a protectionist. He wanted a ter high tariff. He wanted a central bank and uh, so-called internal improvements, uh, government subsidized road building, canal building, and so forth. And uh, Lincoln, when, uh, when he became active in politics in 1832, um, became a Whig. And here's what he said. He said, uh, uh, when he first announced for office in the state legislature, I presume you, you all know who I am. I'm humble Abraham Lincoln. I've been solicited by many friends to become a candidate for the legislature. My politics are short and sweet like the old woman's dance. I'm in favor of a national bank, in favor of the internal improvement system and a high protective tariff, uh, end quote. And that's pretty much, he, he diligently uh, pursued that agenda for some 25 years. In 1859, he announced, quote, I was always a Whig in politics. Uh, when he eulogized Henry Clay in 1852, he said Clay was the great parent of Whig principles. During my whole political life, I have loved and revered Henry Clay as a teacher and a leader. Uh, and there's a new, a relatively new book out called The History of the Whig Party by Michael Holt at the University of Virginia. And he says of Lincoln, he says, quote, few people in the Whig Party were so committed to its economic agenda as Lincoln, end quote. Uh, Robert Johansson says the same thing in his book, Lincoln, the South, and Slavery. And he also says that when the uh, Whig, Whig Party imploded in the 1850s and Lincoln became a Republican, uh, he says, uh, Johansson says, uh, Lincoln had labored for 25 years in behalf of Henry Clay's American system, and he was not prepared to give up that investment. And so he assured the uh, voters in Illinois that there weren't that many differences between the Whig and Republican party, parties. Uh, during the uh, 1840 and 1848 uh, presidential elections, Lincoln made many stump speeches in favor of the Whig candidates promoting the economic agenda. Um, he had a big hand in the, the, the Illinois, the state of Illinois uh, internal improvements uh, disaster in 1837. He was uh, a, uh, an influential member of the legislature, and the Whigs got through a, a $10 million appropriation for road building, canal building, and so forth. And uh, William Herndon uh, claimed that no one had more of a hand in this than Lincoln did. And what happened with this program was described by William Herndon in Life of Lincoln. He said, the gigantic and stupendous operations of the scheme dazzled the eyes of nearly everybody. But in the end, it rolled up a debt so enormous as to impede the otherwise marvelous progress of Illinois. The internal improvement system, the adoption of which Lincoln had played such a prominent part, had collapsed with the result that Illinois was left with an enormous debt and an empty treasury. Uh, it was so bad that the Illinois Constitution was amended to prohibit the use of taxpayer dollars for private corporations of any sort. And uh, also during this period prior to the war, um, almost every state experimented with government sub-corporate welfare, as I call it, for transportation. And it was such a debacle everywhere that by the time the war broke out, only Massachusetts permitted uh, state funding in any way of, of these, these things. It was a horrible disaster everywhere. Uh, Lincoln was a protectionist his whole career. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, he, was, he and a lot of the other Whigs were devotees of Henry C. Carey, a publicist for the Pennsylvania steel industry who once bragged that he only spent three days studying economics, but he could nevertheless debunk Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. And, uh, and in some of his speeches, uh, Lincoln just said what Harry Car Henry Carey was, not Harry Carey, Hen Henry Carey was, uh, was, uh, <laughs> was uh, some Chicago Cubs fans out there. Um, um, he used the argument that transportation costs, what he called useless labor. So that if someone were to ship something from England to the United States as useless labor and we shouldn't shouldn't uh, abide by that. Uh, in one speech, he said that if it were up to him, um, the only things that would be allowed into the country as imports were things we did not make here. If we, if we did not grow coffee here, that's OK. Bring the coffee in. But if we made steel here, no steel. Don't bring steel in. So, uh, so he was an ardent protectionist his whole uh, career. Uh, he once said that his aspiration in his early days was to be uh, the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois. And DeWitt Clinton was the governor of New York who uh, got the Erie Canal passed and is credited with int introducing the spoils system uh, to America. This was a big debate in the early uh, part of the 19th century, the internal improvements debate. Thomas Jefferson's uh, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Albert Gallatin, uh, wrote up a huge central plan. It reminds me almost of sort of a Soviet central plan when you, when you look at it, to build roads and canals all over the place. Uh, Jefferson said, uh, you can't do that unless you amend the Constitution. 
James Madison, the very last thing he did as president was to veto an internal improvements bill because he said he could see nowhere in the Constitution where there was a, the right to spend tax dollars on a private corporation. James Monroe did the same thing, as did Andrew Jackson. On the other side were Hamilton, John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams, uh, after he left the office, in a letter said that one of the deepest regrets he had was not getting, uh, being successful in putting an internal improvements program in. And he blamed uh, what he called Jefferson's blighted breath. And he uh, blamed it on the sable genius of the South, as he said, uh, Calhoun. And so, and then of course, Lincoln picked up this mantle after Henry Clay, the mantle of uh, the, uh, uh, what I call corporate welfare. Um, now this system was called the American system. Henry Clay called this combination of economic policies the American system. And economists, though, call it mercantilism. Uh, it's, it was sort of the old system from Europe, or a close connection between government and business, where the government would dispense favors to special, special friends in business in return for their political support, protectionist tariffs, corporate welfare, inflationism through central banking, uh, in fact, you can, you can argue that many of the people who came to America fled that corrupt <coughs> high tax system. Uh, Edgar Lee Masters, um, not one of uh, Harry's uh, favorite authors, uh, I'm sure, uh, had a description of uh, Henry Clay's economic system that I think he has it on the money, and uh, the, the Clay-Lincoln system. He said, Henry Clay was a champion of that political system which doles favors to the strong in order to win and to keep their adherence to the government. His system offered shelter to devious schemes and corrupt enterprises. He was the beloved son of Alexander Hamilton with his corrupt funding schemes, his superstitions concerning the advantage of a public debt and a people tax to make profits for enterprises that cannot stand alone. His example and his doctrines led to the creation of a party that had no platform to announce, the Whig Party, because its principles were plunder and nothing else. And uh, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, it's, it, it was a special interest program. Now, the importance of the tariff. As I said, uh, Lincoln, uh, among the things his whole career uh, they did was he was an advocate of protectionism. And there's a, a very important article to this issue by uh, Reinhard uh, Luthen in the American Historical Review, July 19, 1944, that gives a good explanation of the importance of the tariff to Lincoln's political career. And it starts out by uh, noting how in, in the election, Pennsylvania had the second most, uh, second highest number of electoral votes, and its issue was a protectionist tariff. And the Pennsylvania Republican Party made it known that anyone who wins Pennsylvania must sign on to a protective tariff. They were in the catbird seat. They had the power. Uh, and then um, uh, Joseph Medill, the M-E-D-I-L-L, -L, the editor of the Chicago Press and Tribune, a very influential paper, began promoting favorite son Abraham Lincoln for, for the presidency. And the way he did it was he began writing editorials saying things like this. He said, quote, Lincoln was an old clay Whig. He's right on the tariff, and he's exactly right on all other issues. Is there any man who could suit Pennsylvania better? And so he's promoting him. Lincoln started soliciting the nomination um, there is a relative by marriage of Lincoln's name, Dr. Edward Wallace, in Pennsylvania, and he was a Republican. And uh, he, he wrote a letter to his brother, who passed it on to Lincoln, inquiring as of what, what are Lincoln's views on the tariff. And Lincoln wrote back on uh, October 11, 1859. He said, my dear sir, your brother, Dr. William S. Wallace, showed me a letter of yours in which you kindly mention my name, inquire for my tariff views, and suggest the propriety of my writing a letter upon the subject. I was an old Henry Clay tariff Whig. In old times, I made more speeches on that subject than any other. I have not since changed my views." End quote. So Lincoln is, <clears throat> is establishing his bona fides as a protectionist here. And at the Republican Convention of 1860, uh, Luthen writes about a first-hand account of what happened when the, the tariff plank was adopted. He said this, quote, the Pennsylvania and New Jersey delegations were terrific in their applause over the tariff resolution, and their hilarity was contagious, finally pervading the whole vast auditorium. It was a big deal. Uh, Pennsylvania went for Lincoln. They voted for Lincoln, and he won Pennsylvania, and by winning Pennsylvania, um, that, you know, that certainly was a huge help in, him, in his uh, is winning the election. And then when he went back to Springfield, there was a Republican Party rally for him. And uh, they, they had a big uh, uh, float. 
It had, according to Luthan, he says, several yards of jeans cloth from which a garment was fashioned for Lincoln, and the wagon bore the significant motto, quote, protection to home industry, end quote. So this was a big issue. I'm not saying slavery was not also a big issue. It certainly was. I don't argue that in my book. But economics was also important. Now, now look at the moral, the moral tariff was passed by the House of Representatives in the 1859-1860 session. And then the Senate passed it on May 2nd, 1861, two days before Lincoln was inaugurated. President Buchanan signed it into law. And so Lincoln didn't really have directly anything to do with it, although Luthan point, points out how he did have a lot to do with it by working behind the scenes on all the, the political maneuvering. And, uh, and Lincoln was certainly a master politician. And so here you have uh, Frank Talsic, the great tariff historian, in his book Tariff History of the United States, saying that as of 1857, the average tariff rate was about 15 percent, one five. The Southerners had been complaining since the tariff of abominations in 1828 that they were being plundered by the tariff. They were import dependent. Talsig says that they were paying as much as 80 percent of all the tariff. Uh, in various years, sometimes less than that, but uh, he mentions that, that figure. The Republican Party orchestrates the moral tariff. That was their baby. And they propose essentially tripling the rate. Yeah, the rate would immediately go up to 37.5%, but then it would greatly expand the list of items that were covered. So there was roughly a tripling of the tariff tax. And then right after that, the rate went up to 47%. And so here's what's happening. The Southerners have been complaining for decades that they're being plundered by the tariff. They're paying most of it, and most of the money is being spent in the North. The Republicans come in and say, we're going to triple that. Lincoln is expected to enforce it. He makes his first inaugural address on May 4th, Mar March 4th, and he says this, quote, the power confided in me will be used to hold, occupy, and possess the property and places belonging to the government and to collect the duties and imposts. But beyond what may be necessary for these objects, there will be no invasion, no using force against or among the people anywhere, end quote. So the way I read that, he says, as long as you collect this triple tariff rate, there will be no invasion. But if you, refuse, if you, if you do what the South Carolinians did to Andrew Jackson and nullify it, that is, say we're not going to collect it, there will be an invasion. He promised an invasion over the tariff. Um, after he was elected, Senator John Sherman uh, was quoted in uh, David Donald's book, Re Lincoln Reconsidered, of uh, why Senator John Sherman thought Lincoln was elected. And he said this. Senator John Sherman is better known for the, uh, being the author of the Sherman Antitrust Act. He was the brother of General William Tecumseh Sherman, influential member of the Senate during the war and for 30-some years after. Those, here's what he said. Those who elected Mr. Lincoln expect him to secure to free labor its just right to the territories, to protect by wise revenue laws the labor of our people, to secure the public lands to actual settlers, to develop the uh, internal resources of the country by opening new means of communication between the Atlantic and the Pacific." End quote. David Donald, in his book, says, let me translate this from the politician's idiom into plain English. And, here's, and how David Donald translates that is this. This is David Donald the Pulitzer Prize winning Lincoln biographer. And I, I, it's a great book. I recommend it to everybody. That David should be selling it here. Uh, Lincoln and the Republicans intended to enact a high protective tariff that mothered monopoly, to pass a homestead law that invited speculators to loot the public domain, and to subsidize a transcontinental railroad that afforded infinite opportunities for jobbery." End quote. And of course, all that happened. Yeah, David Donald left out the first line opposition to the extension of slavery into the territories. And of course, one of the reasons Lincoln and the Republicans gave for their opposition to the extension of slavery is they wanted to preserve the new territories for white labor. They were very clear on that. They said they wanted the political support of white laborers who did not want competition from slave labor. Uh, yes, he made many eloquent statements in favor of natural rights, but that was also part of the reason they gave for, for opposition to this. Now, how was this to be achieved? Uh, how, how is this to be achieved? Not with secession, that's for sure. Um, at the time, at the time, there's a big two-volume set of books called Northern Editorials on Secession by Howard Cecil Perkins. And he writes about how a lot of uh, citizens and a lot of editorial writers in the North, he claims the majority of editorial writers in the North 
were in favor of peaceful secession. And I'll give you one or two examples. The Bangor Daily Noon uh, Union on, on November 13th, 1860 said this, the union depends for its continuance on the free consent and will of the sovereign people of each state. And when that consent and will is withdrawn on either part, their union is gone. A state coerced to remain in the union is a subject province and can never be a co-equal member of the American Union. And he quotes uh, numerous papers, there are numerous newspapers that say those things in the North. Now, where did they get this idea that, uh, that, uh, of state sovereignty? Well, it might have been uh, Thomas Jefferson in 1816 said this, if any state in the union will declare that it prefers a separation to a continuance in union, I have no hesitation in saying, let us separate. John Quincy Adams in 1839 in the Jubilee of the Constitution addressed secession. And he said, if it would ever happen, he said then, quote, then will be the time for reverting to the precedents which occurred at the formation and adoption of the Constitution to form again a more perfect union by dissolving that which could no longer bind and to leave the separated parts to be reunited by the law of political gravitation to the center, end quote. And so he wasn't in favor of forceful uh, uh, you know, military action against it. Tocqueville said, uh, uh, democracy in America, the Arlington House, 1945 version, page 381, the union was formed by the voluntary agreement of the states, and in uniting together, they have not forfeited their nationality, nor have they been reduced to the condition of one and the same people. If one of the states chooses to withdraw from the compact, it would be difficult to disprove its right of doing so, and the federal government would have no means of maintaining its claim directly, either by force or right. And so, other, other relevant facts that I think are relevant, um, Harry argues with these, but each colony did declare sovereignty from Great Britain on its own. After the revolution, each, the Treaty of Paris, each state was individually recognized as sovereign by the British government. The Articles of Confederation said, quote, each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence. The states then seceded from the, uh, the uh, articles and dropped the perpetual union language in the Constitution. Virginia's ratifying convention said, quote, the powers granted under the Constitution being derived from the people of the United States may be resumed by them whenever, whensoever the same shall be perverted to their injury or oppression, end quote. And then they asserted this right for all other states. In Federalist 39, Madison said ratification was would be achieved by the people, quote, not as individuals composing one entire nation, but as composing the distinct and independent states to which they respectively belong. Um, after Jefferson was elected, the New England Federalists attempted to secede for about 10 or 12 years, and they held a secession convention in Hartford, Connecticut. They voted not to secede, but the leader of this was Timothy Pickering, who was George Washington's Secretary of State and Secretary of War, and he said that secession was the principle of the, of the American Revolution to justify this New England secession movement. There's a book called, by William Wright called The uh, Secession Movement in the Middle Atlantic States, where he writes about a vigorous secession movement there. Uh, prior to the war, where people there believed there was a right of secession. Uh, and, but Lincoln uh, had to uh, deny this, that there was a right of secession. And uh, I quote the legal scholar James Ostrowski, who I think put together a summary of what Lincoln's interpretation of the Constitution on this topic has to say. And it's sort of a mind game. He looks he says, well, this is what the founders had to have believed in when they were ratifying the Constitution in order to take Lincoln's position. One, no state may ever secede for any reason. Two, if a state does secede, the federal government may suppress the secession with military force. Three, the federal government may coerce all states to provide militias to suppress a seceding state. Four, after suppressing the seceded state, the federal government may govern that state with a military dictatorship until the state accepts the supremacy of the federal government. Five, after the suppression, the federal government may force the state to adopt a new constitution imposed on it by military force, which happened in Reconstruction. Six, the president may unilaterally suspend the Bill of Rights and the writ of habeas corpus. If they believe, uh, and it's, it's unlikely that if they believe those things, the constitution would ever pass, it was barely passed uh, to begin with. And uh, I have another chapter, uh, um, that's the real hackle raiser, I guess, it's called Was Lincoln a Dictator? And uh, I've read these books, you know, if you read uh, Constitutional Problems Under Lincoln by uh, James Randall, Freedom Under Lincoln by Dean Sprague, Fate of Liberty by Mark Neely, Constitutional Dictatorship by Clinton Rossiter, 
you have Clinton Rossiter saying, Clinton's amazing disregard for the Constitution was considered by nobody as legal. Uh, James Ford Rhodes, in his History of the United States, he said, never had the power of a dictator fallen into safer and nobler hands. Uh, James Randall, again, in Constitutional Problems under Lincoln, said, if Lincoln was a dictator, it must be admitted that he was a benevolent dictator. Now, why are these scholars all calling Lincoln a dictator? Well, he launched a military invasion without consent of Congress. He suspended habeas corpus, and uh, which ended up uh, at least 13,000 northern citizens imprisoned uh, without, without being arrested, without a warrant being issued. Uh, uh, there was a, a, a prison in For uh, New York Harbor that became known as the, the American Bastille, Fort Lafayette, censored all telegraph communication, nationalized railroads, ordered federal troops to interfere with northern elections. David Donald writes that uh, the Republican Party won New York State by 7,000 votes in, in 1864, quote, with the help of federal bayonets, end quote. Deported Ohio Congressman Clement Vallandigham uh, for disagreeing with him. Confiscated firearms. Uh, ministers in the South were imprisoned for not praying for Abraham Lincoln. Uh, William Seward set up a secret police force and he famously boasted to uh, Lord Lyons, the British ambassador, that he could ring a bell and have any man in America arrested. The Journal of Commerce, early in the Lincoln administration, published a list of 100 newspapers in opposition to Lincoln administration. And uh, Lincoln uh, uh, ordered the Postmaster General to stop delivering the mail for those papers. Some of them ordered, uh, hired paper boys, uh, but then uh, they put an end to that too. And so a lot of newspaper, and a lot of these newspaper owners and editors were imprisoned at, the, at this time. Um, and so anyway, uh, that's why uh, that, that was apparently uh, necessary to stop the secession. He also, uh, James McPherson um, writes in, I think it's his book, uh, Abraham Lincoln and the Second American Revolution, of what a micromanager Lincoln was of the war effort. And he, he spent 11 days in the, in the field with the Army of the Potomac. Uh, McPherson says he, he, he spent more time in the War Department telegraph office than anywhere else except the White House itself. Uh, Stephen Oates says pretty much the same thing, that he was very hands-on and that, and that he knew all about what Sherman was up to and what Sheridan, Sheridan was up to. And uh, in the, I don't have much time left, but in the, in the interest of saving time, I argue in my book that there, was, there were incidents of waging war on civilians at the very beginning, 1862, 1863. Uh, the town of Randolph, Tennessee was burned to the ground because Confederate sharpshooters were shooting at, uh, at uh, Union ships. Uh, and they couldn't find the sharpshooters, so they retaliated by burning the town. Uh, and, and this sort of thing went on the whole, the whole time. And so uh, in, the, in one of the latter chapters of my book uh, called The Great Centralizer, I write about how all of these economic things were achieved in the first 18 months of the Lincoln administration. Um, the tariff was essentially tripled and remained that high for, for decades after the war ended. The internal improvements, um, Leonard Curry in his book Blueprint for a Modern Society uh, says that there were, quote, no more constitutional scruples. That is, for 70 years there were constitutional arguments against corporate welfare. No more. This was gone. Nationalized money supply at last. Senator John Sherman again, when they, as a result of the National Currency Acts and Illegal Tenders, ten, Tender Acts, he said this, these will nationalize as much as possible, even the currency, so as to make men love their country before their states. All private interests, all local interests, all banking interests, the interests of individuals, everything should be subordinate now to the interest of the government, end quote. Senator John Sherman. The New York Times editorialized on March 9th, 1863, that, quote, the Legal Tender Act and the National Currency Bill crystallized a centralization of power such as Hamilton might have eulogized as magnificent, end quote. And uh, uh, how much time do I have, David? Two minutes. Two minutes. You could you turn that on? Or? I think in the front. Oh, yeah. I think in the front here. No, this side. Is that upside down? In uh, one question I ask here, in terms of the cost of the war, 620,000 deaths um, in a population of 30 million people, if you standardize that for today's population of roughly 280 million, that would be the equivalent of about 5.5 million deaths or a hundred times the number of Americans who died in Vietnam. And I look at that, and that's absolutely horrible, no one would disagree with that, 
And in, in, in the book Time on the Cross by Fogel and Engerman, they do a, a survey of emancipation uh, and in, in, the, in this time period. And they find that dozens of countries, including the British Empire, the Spanish Empire, the French and Danish colonies, dozens of countries ended slavery peacefully through some sort of compensated emancipation. Now, of course, uh, the standard argument is that this could never have happened here. We could have never have done this. But I don't see any reason to believe why British slave owners valued their slaves any, any less than American slave owners did. They didn't want this. The British government paid them off 40 cents on the dollar. Uh, it might not have been possible in 1861. But I think in terms of the, the sheer amount of the death and the total destruction of, the, of the, uh, the economy of the country, North and South, the North took a huge economic hit as well as the South because of all the disinterrupted trade. The one big quandary is why didn't we do much, do what every other country in the world did during the previous 50 years that ended slavery and ended peacefully through compensated emancipation. Final thing I'll say is that some of the great classical liberals or Lockean uh, liberals, if you will, at the time uh, were not on Lincoln's side. Lord Acton wrote a letter to Robert E. Lee on November 4, 1866 and said this, I saw in states' rights the only availing check upon the absolutism of the sovereign will, and secession filled me with hope not as a destruction, but as a redemption of democracy. I deem that you were fighting the battles of our liberty, our progress, and our civilization, and I mourn for the stake which is lost at Richmond more deeply than I rejoice over that which was saved at Waterloo. And the, the famous uh, abolitionist Lysander Spooner, who uh, was quite famous in Massachusetts because he wrote, he wrote uh, a book on really on jury nullification, a guide for lawyers in New England to how to go about getting juries to nullif nullify uh, jury verdicts that would send slaves back to the South. And he was a big hero among the Massachusetts abolitionists. But by 1870, after he had observed what had happened, he said this, all these cries of having abolished slavery, of having saved the country, of having preserved the union, of establishing a government of consent and of maintaining the national honor are all gross, shameless, transparent cheats, so transparent that they ought to deceive no one, end quote. And this is a prominent uh, abolitionist saying this. And the final thing I'll say is General Don Pyatt, who was a friend of Lincoln's, made a very interesting comment to me. He was a newspaper editor after the war. And he said that the way in which the Republican Party used the former slaves as political pawns in the South so poisoned late race relations in the South that they may never recover from that. And uh, Tocqueville actually noticed in Democracy in America that he said that he thought race relations were actually worse in the states that had eliminated slavery as of the eight, early 1830s than in than the South. Whether that, that's just one man's observation, but I think that's one of the costs of the war, the poisoning of race relations. And I think, uh, I think African Americans would have achieved, as Jeff Hummel has said, uh, no, it's not Jeff Hummel, it's Doug Bando. Sorry, Jeff, I don't want to bring you in on this, that they would have received justice as well as freedom sooner, much sooner, had we done what England did in all the other countries of the world. Time is up. OK. Um we have five minutes each for our speakers to respond or make additional points, and we'll start with Harry. I wish I had 55 minutes instead of five, so I have to be very selective. Uh, first of all, on the question of the tariff, uh, it may come as news to Professor DiLorenzo that the protective tariffs were first instituted by Jefferson and Madison, uh, not by, ha by the Hamiltonian party. Hamilton tried to get the tariffs, uh, but he was not successful. Uh, and the reason why the, the protective tariffs first entered our system uh, in the wake of Jefferson's embargo, which put the, the, the New England shipping interests out of business. And it was, and the, the, so the first protective tariffs were put in by, uh, I think, in, in Madison's administration, and supported by John C. Calhoun, uh, who agreed that at that time the, it was owed to the New England people to uh, to give them uh, their infant industries protection because they had been put out of business by the embargo, and later by the War of 1812 conducted under Madison's administration. 
Madison, by the way, had opposed both the bank and tariffs when, Madison, when Hamilton was Secretary of Treasury. He signed into law the second bank of the United States and, and endorsed the tariff, uh, said that it had been ratified by the people in subsequent elections, so he reversed his position on that. What happened in 1828 is also a very curious fact. Uh, 1828 was a crucial moment in the history of the tariff because the national debt was, has, was just being paid off. And so the income from the tariff would produce a surplus in the treasury. And at that time, there was a great fear that a surplus in the federal treasury might be used to buy slaves, uh, buy the freedom of slaves. Uh, so the slave issue really underlay, underlay the tariff issue. But it also happened that in the committee which was, uh, which was scheduling the tariffs, uh, the people in, in South Carolina and I, I think other Southerners, they moved to, to, they, to raise the tariffs to this abominable level on the assumption that they, they would be voted down in the, on the floor of the House. And they got fooled by that. that instead of being voted down, it was voted in. <laughs> But they were hoist by their own petard. But I'm not saying that that, but, but in 1833, in the crisis of nullification, the tariffs were, were, were uh, uh, <coughs> compromised, was reached. The tariffs were reduced. Uh, Jackson's uh, force bill was repealed. And so the, there was a peaceful resolution of that. Uh, the, the question, I, I myself believe in free trade uh, and uh, would be glad it could be implemented whenever possible, but in the actual conflict that led to the Civil War, we had two obstacles to free trade. And I ask you to think which one of them was the greater obstacle. One was the tariff, and the other was slavery. Uh, don't we hear nowadays objections on the part of the labor unions to importing uh, goods from, from China, which is made with slave labor? Uh, is, is the existence of slave labor not a reflection upon the idea of, of a free commercial society? Uh, now, it's absolutely true, and I agree with Professor DiLorenzo, that the Republican Party could never have been successful without the support of the, of the tariff interests involved. Uh, the Free Soil Party and the Liberty Party were, 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 were anti-slavery parties, which were, you might say, pure in their principles but they had no chance of being successful on a national basis. It was the addition of the tariff interests which gave the Republicans the ability to carry their anti-slavery program into action. And it's in that light, I think, that you have to look at the whole, at the whole question of the tariffs. Uh, as far as the Hamilton, the banks and tariffs and uh, banks and internal improvements, uh, contrary to Professor DiLorenzo, I think that I think, and so other people have thought that Hamilton was the greatest secretary of the treasury we ever had. Uh, the assumption of the debts of the states uh, and the funding of the debt through the bank <coughs> produced an enormous prosperity in the country. And the, this was all done under Washington's administration. And uh, if you want to speak of Federalists and people supporting the Federalist agenda, economic agenda, the first one of them was uh, George Washington. Uh, now, there's one thing that on the subject of, of, of states' rights and state sovereignty, a document which is, uh, which is very seldom cited, but which is absolutely fundamental to understanding the status of, of, uh, the, of sovereignty under the Constitution. Uh, and that is in, in the letter that George Washington wrote transmitting the Congress, the, the new Constitution, to the Congress on September 17, 1787. And among the ironies of this letter is the fact that, that John C. Calhoun, in his discourse on the Constitution and Government of the United States, the sequel to his uh, disquisition on government, cites the, the words that Washington used to, to support his position that, that this was a federal government and that federal meant one in which the constituent parts retained complete sovereignty. Uh, and he refers to the fact that, that, that Washington refers to the federal government of, of these states. Now, the truth of the matter is that the idea of the, the meaning of the word federal underwent a change 
from the Articles of Confederation uh, to the Constitution. Uh, the, <clears throat> the, the, under the Constitution, the states gave up their sovereignty in the Calhounian sense. And if you have any doubt about that, let us let me just read a sentence from George Washington. <clears throat> it is obviously impracticable in the federal government of these states to secure all rights of independent sovereignty to each, and yet provide for the interest and safety of all. So all the rights of independent sovereignty, or some of those rights, have been surrendered. With this, we are introduced to a, to a unique uh, American <laughs> contribution to political science. Dual sovereignty, dual federalism and dual sovereignty. The states are sovereign within the, 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 the spheres of the powers that are reserved to them by the Constitution. They are not sovereign in those things which are delegated to the United States as a whole. And if you look at the things that are denied to the states in the Constitution, for example, they're denied the right to coin money. Now, throughout history, the right to coin money has been has been a symbol of sovereignty. Uh, the states do not have the right to coin money. They are not sovereign in the state in the sense in which which would justify uh, secession as a state right. Uh, my five minutes up. Yes. <laughs> Thank I wish you. It was five hours. <laughs> We'll have time during the Q&A to pursue more of this as well. And now Tom has his five minutes. Uh, well, I wouldn't argue that two, two wrongs make a right. I would argue that Jefferson, that's one of the dumbest things he did was the embargo. So if he was a protectionist in his early days, uh, that's uh, shame on him. Uh, I wouldn't defend him just because he's a Southerner or anything like that. That's, uh, it's the matter is liberty to me. And the same goes with Madison or Calhoun or anybody else. And uh, as far as anti-slavery, I'd just like to uh, mention that um, I think that as far as the Republican Party's anti-slavery position, uh, uh, well, as Harry mentioned, Lincoln supported the Fugitive Slave Clause. And you know that's precisely why William Lloyd Garrison, the greatest abolitionist, uh, the banner of his newspaper, uh, you know, declared that he wanted he advocated secession of the northern states. <laughs> From, from the Union, precisely because it would eliminate the, uh, the Fugitive Slave Clause. It wouldn't be a matter anymore. And it would greatly have increased the cost to the slave owners of capturing their own runaways. And, and I think it was a brilliant thing on his part that he understood that this would, this would undermine and dis ultimately destroy slavery. Uh, and, but Lincoln supported that in his first inaugural. He certainly did. And also, among the reasons he gave for uh, being anti-slavery, quote, was one, free labor. They didn't. It was labor market protectionism, economics again. Uh, he clearly said they didn't that they wanted to secure the new territories for for free labor, for white labor uh, that wouldn't comp uh, compete with slaves for jobs. And the second reason, well, another reason he gave, was the three fifths of the clause, three fifths clause of the Constitution, artificially inflated the congressional representation of the Democratic Party, because it said that for every five slaves. You could count that as three people for purposes of determining how many members of Congress would come from each state. And in one of his speeches, he compared Maine and South Carolina and said that because there were so many slaves in South Carolina and they were counted in this way, South Carolinians had more votes than uh, the people in Maine did in Congress. And so that wasn't a moral argument. So they weren't entirely moral arguments that they were, the Republicans were making. When, they, when, when we use the language anti-slavery. And Henry Clay, I, I quote him as saying, after the tariff of abominations was uh, renegotiated and whittled down in 1833, that he, uh, he threatened to defy the devil himself, as he put it, to, to, to raise the tariff rate once again in the 40% range. He's furious uh, about that. But maybe that's all I'll say for now, and we'll have uh, questions. Yeah. <laughs> Say something now? Uh, you don't have to wait for a question. Well, why don't you say you can sit right here? All right. Uh, but Professor DiLorenzo thinks that it is a uh, reflection on on, on uh, Lincoln's anti-slavery uh, character that he that he supported the uh, Fugitive Slave Act. But the Fugitive Slave Clause is in the Constitution, and Lincoln thought that any 
refusal to implement the right clearly defined in the Constitution would justify secession. You, you, can't, you can't pick and choose which parts of the Constitution you like. Once you do that, uh, then the Constitution is simply, as Jefferson said once, a blank sheet of paper. Jefferson said that when he was contemplating purchasing Louisiana. And having said that he, by purchasing it, he would make the Constitution a blank sheet of paper, he went ahead and purchased Louisiana. Uh, well, then he should have advocated a constitutional amendment to get rid of the Fugitive Slave Clause. Uh, okay, well, question. That could never have been, uh, that was not possible. Um, wait for the microphone somewhere. and hold it horizontally and, and make it a question, not a speech. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Di Lorenzo, given that the U.S. government would not buy out slave owners, can you address the assertion that the only way to end slavery, or that the the, the strongest way to ensure the freedom of slaves, was to keep the Union intact? Uh, well, I think slavery. I, I don't want to. I hate to quote Alexander Stevens because he'll excuse me, of some vile uh, behavior. But he once, he once said slavery was more secure in the Union than out of it. And he, he agreed with uh, William Lloyd Garrison in that regard, in that uh, the Fugitive Slave Clause made it uh, more secure. And there were other, state, other laws, too, that <coughs> subsidized the slave owners indirectly, as far as that goes. And uh, we may never know the answer. Uh, but the death is what bothers me, the, the, the equivalent of five and a half million deaths standardized for our population today. When the rest of the world did find a way, it wouldn't have happened immediately, but uh, England did it in six years. It took six years to end slavery in the British Empire. And as I said, I think uh, African Americans, I don't think African Americans didn't really achieve justice in this country until 30 or 40 years ago, in, in my opinion. And that would have come much, much sooner had we done what England did. Uh, right back here. Did you want to comment? Sure. Yeah, I'd like to comment. <laughs> right. First place, the, the idea that the federal government in 1860 should have offered to buy the slaves is, is a political absurdity. Any uh, claim by Lincoln or his party to have any jurisdiction over slavery in the states would have been regarded and justly regarded as, as, as completely unconstitutional and advocating the overthrow of the Constitution. Now, during the Civil War, Lincoln did try to did endorse a program of compensated emancipation. In his 1862 uh, message to Congress, he proposed a series of constitutional amendments which would have authorized the federal government to reimburse states which adopted programs of compensated emancipation. Uh, he was very anxious, this was after the, uh, or not after, but before the Emancipation Proclamation, the final one was issued on January 1st, 1863. But he did want to see to it that loyal slave owners would, were not expropriated by his emancipation policy. But he couldn't get the Congress to adopt, he couldn't get any representatives and people from Kentucky or Missouri, the border states, you see, to vote for it. And so he failed. This is the message to Congress, which ended with those wor wonderful words, gentlemen of the Congress, we cannot escape history. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of Earth. Well, it failed. Uh, there was, so the, 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 and speak, comparing what happened in England, after all, in England, the parliament in Westminster w was making laws for the West Indies. And the West Indians didn't have any representation in the parliament. The laws were made for them, and they had to go along with it. Uh, we, there was no such power within the, the, the federal uh, government to uh, interfere with slavery, except in the, uh, by limiting the expansion of slavery. And it was Lincoln's belief, and I think the, the best economic analysis that we have of the American economy in the antebellum United States indicates that if the expansion of slavery had been ended, uh, and if it was no longer possible for surplus slaves to be sold from the old states to new territories, that the, the, the pressure within the states to uh, adopt 
programs of emancipation would become great enough to do that. In other words, Lincoln's belief was that slavery could be ended peacefully through the action of the states themselves. It couldn't be done through direct intervention by the federal government, but it could be done within the states themselves. And after all, all of the states north of the Mason-Dixon line had adopted plans for emancipation. <coughs> slavery, slavery was lawful in every one of the 13 colonies and the 13 states which, which uh, uh, were part of the, uh, <coughs> declared their independence. By the way, Professor Lorenzo is absolutely wrong in saying that the that the 13 states were recognized as independent, separate sovereignties. They were not. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, in, in 1826, Madison and Jefferson t together, in making rules for, uh, for the University of Virginia, uh, resolved that the first of the, of the documents which, which should be studied by the law faculty in the University of Virginia was the Declaration of Independence as the act of union of these states. The declaration was a, de de a declaration of separation from Great Britain <coughs> and union with each other. And the resolutions of the state legislatures or state re revolutionary colon colonial legislatures on the road to independence, they almost all of them passed resolutions calling for independence and for union. Uh, but all those, those same resolutions said that in the declaration of union, the, the internal police of each colony should be recognized as as, uh, as binding. In other words, the origins of American dual federalism is to be found in the resolutions of the revolutionary assemblies authorizing the, con the Continental Congress to declare independence. They declared independence and union together, and there was never any time in which any state was uh, act acted on the international sphere, uh, having, del having uh, diplomatic relations and the Constitution <coughs> itself forbids the, each state to have any diplomatic, uh, 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 any diplomatic uh, action on the, it could, it could not act independently of the other states uh, in the international arena. Tom, you had a really quick, you have a really quick. A really, uh, really quick, I, I actually did reread the Treaty of Paris where I came out here and it does list each state by name in the, in the Treaty of Paris and also Lincoln's, uh, Emancipation in the Border States uh, proposal. Uh, he's called it a war measure, you know, not an emancipation measure, and he combined it with deportation. Any of the freed slaves would be deported to Central America, Africa, or Haiti, and that was his career-long position was colonization. He was, he was, he took that from Henry Clay, and so he combined it with deportation. Uh, okay, right here, uh, Doctor. Um, Jaffa, I want to ask you this. You are an opponent of legal positivism in most of your writings. I remember during the Bork nomination, you made very big point of this. And yet, you constantly uphold the Constitution as kind of sacrosanct, as opposed to the natural rights tradition that is enunciated in the Declaration of Independence. Now, if we do have unalienable rights to liberty, as the Declaration proclaims, then why does it matter so much to you that the Constitution somehow does not sanction secession? I, as a free person from a free country, ought to be able to leave if I choose and take whatever is mine with me. And if a whole bunch of people want to join me, we ought to be able to do that because we have a natural right, an unalienable right, to our life, liberty, and our pursuit of happiness. Yeah, okay. Okay. Is that for me or yeah. Well, it was addressed to me, so. Uh, we have these unalienable rights, uh, and in the exercise of these same inalienable rights, we agree with each other to form civil governments, see. Uh, and uh, Madison has an, ex has an essay on sovereignty, which is a, a sort of simplified repetition of John Locke's argument in the second chapter of the second treatise. Uh, <coughs> Should I stand up? No, you're fine. Uh, you're, fine. No, you're fine. You're fine. Just stand up. Right. Okay. They can hear you. The uh, thing works. If if the people in this room were not citizens of the United States, if they were not citizens of any state, or of any uh, sovereign government, uh, and if we decided uh, that we needed to, for our own protection, first beginning with safety, and we September 11th told us why we need each other for the sake of safety. 
uh, for the sake of our safety, what we want, we need to have a government. Uh, and that government, for, for us, for that, for our agreement to form a government, we have to recognize, each one of us, that the right to life and to liberty and property of each one of us shall be protected by this government. Uh, there's uh, not, no one of us can say that he deserves protection for the government to be formed, but not somebody else, or that somebody is entitled to more protection than anybody else. Anybody who demands more protection from the government than his fellow citizens uh, won't be accepted as a fellow citizen. But once we have reached this agreement and we then elect a government, uh, and that government functions to, uh, the, 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 and the, the, the election for that government is one in which there is freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of association, so that it is a legitimate government, then that government commands our obedience. We have no right to, to reject our duty to obey because we don't like the result of the election, provided the election is conducted uh, fairly and constitutional rights are, on, uh, are, are, are observed. You cannot have free government if you cannot uh, bind the people who participate in the government to, uh, to accept the results of the election. And that flows from our, uh, it is our, the exercise of our unalienable right to life that enables us and justifies us in forming legitimate governments. When those governments are formed, we cannot reject them because we don't like the results. Tom, did you have it? Um, let's let some more people ask okay, questions. Sure. I've talked a lot. Right in the back. Uh, I mean, a lot of hands. <clears throat> this is a question for, for both of you. Was it the consensus uh, of the Constitutional, the members of the Constitutional Convention that the Articles of Confederation had failed and that when they entered into the Constitutional Convention that, that they were surrendering voluntarily uh, and knowingly surrendering their sovereignty? in order to form a, a new constitution. The, the 43rd Federalist deals with, the, definitively with this question. There was no question, but the, the Constitutional Convention, simply as a convention, had no authority of any kind. It did not form a government, but it said that the ratification of nine states shall then bring this new government into existence. The, the uh, Continental, the, the Congress of the Confederation transmitted the results of the to the country, the ratifications took place, and the government came into existence. Uh, I don't know uh, what, what uh, Tom? Well, uh, <clears throat> Virginia, New York, and Rhode Island asserted the right to secede from the Union as a condition uh, of uh, ratifying the Constitution, and they asserted that right for the other states as well, and they were allowed into the Union after doing that, and so uh, that, that is one thing that happened. Now, I, one other thing I want to mention was- That is absolutely wrong. You're just well, flat out wrong. I quoted the Virginia, I quoted I, the Virginia uh, thing in my- They uh, did not speak of secession as a lawful right under the Constitution. Sovereign. It, it, it was an exercise of the right of revolution which they had recently exercised under the British Constitution, but you simply stubbornly refused to recognize there's a difference between secession as a constitutional right and revolution as a, as a natural. Right. I disagree with that. I just I know you're wrong. Plain, plain <laughs> I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong. You're just wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I would like to ask uh, both speakers uh, to answer the question of uh, the egregious amount <clears throat> amount of violation of the Constitution. It, the South has, has been claimed seceded in violation of the Constitution. The Lincoln administration uh, became a dictatorship in, in violation of the Constitution. Which of these two violations are the most egregious? But, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the question. If both the South and the North violated the Constitution, which was a more important violation? Is that a fair rendition of your point? Which is the most agreed? Well, I don't. I don't think uh, 
I'm still not of the opinion that the Constitution says anything one way or the other about secession, although William Rawl, who, whose book was used to uh, teach all the cadets at West Point constitutional law prior to the war, he argued that there was a constitutional right of secession, but there aren't too many arguments like that. But I don't think uh, it says one, th one way or another. So I would say, uh, without a doubt, during the Lincoln administration, that's why Clinton Rossiter and James Ford Rhodes called him a dictator, but a good dictator, because of all the violations of civil liberties. Even uh, Mark Neely, he even writes, there's one page in his book, uh, it's in there, I forget what the page number is, but uh, political prisoners in the North, there weren't many of them, but some were hung by their wrists in uh, uh, water tortured. Uh, and that sort of thing went on with William Seward's secret police. And so, uh, and I don't think secession was unconstitutional in my view. Any uh, questions on this side? Carl? Doctor, Dr. Jaffin, do you, do you really believe that, do you really believe that September 11th uh, proves that we need a federal government to keep us safe? <laughs> I think we've had ample proof of that in two world wars as well as, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think that September 11th uh, reinforced the sense that national, that, that security of life and liberty and property depends upon government. Uh, I don't see how it can be protected in a state of anarchy where there is no, there is no national defense forces or no police. Of course we need, uh, we need government and we need a federal government because we are a, a government of many states in, in one nation. Well, since you're looking at me, I would, uh, one more point I would make is I think Lincoln destroyed the Union as a voluntary association of states. He didn't save it. He destroyed it. And I don't see why we couldn't have a union of states for self-defense measures like that. And, uh, but uh, with regard to your question, uh, you know, the, the federal government still doesn't allow airline pilots, pilots to arm themselves. So the idea that they're protecting us, uh, I've been in airports a lot in the last couple of days, and it's kind of silly that they're protecting us with these, these procedures. But I don't, no, I'm not arguing against having a, a union or a federal government. Uh, my question is also for Professor Jaffe, although I'd like to give um, Professor DeLorenzo a chance to comment on it also if he'd like, since I think most of the questions have been going to his opponent here. But um, in your closing remarks, Professor Jaffe, you mentioned that uh, you thought Lincoln supported the Fugitive Slave Act because he didn't want to pick and choose from the Constitution because that would have uh, ended up justifying secession. Yeah. But uh, didn't he, in fact, go on to do many later things that uh, egregiously violated the Constitution and thus, according to your own argument, justified secession? Uh, and um, as a, a second kind of fo follow-up to that, I'd just like to hear a little bit more about your thoughts of when exactly people do deserve the right to self-determination. Well, in the first place, I deny that Lincoln acted unconstitutionally uh, at any time during the Civil War. Uh, it was a civil war. The, the, there, was, uh, there were uh, tra 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 traitors in the midst of all of the free states. Uh, the the uh, uh, possibility of recruiting soldiers and keeping them from deserting. There was lots of desertion on both sides in the Civil War. And there were, it just happens that there, more, there were more Confederate soldiers executed for desertion than there were Union soldiers. But there was plenty of executions on both sides. Uh, it was a, a, a terrible war, and nobody's, uh, but the, the idea that the cost of the war is due to Lincoln is simply absurd. It was a terrible war because the country was deeply divided, and the question of, of the future of the, of the nation, whether or not it would be based upon principles recognized as principles of individual liberty, or whether or not slavery would be, uh, become, uh, whether the idea of one race dominating another race and uh, would be accepted as a, uh, as a means for, for governance. Uh, let me just read one uh, short statement here that might interest you. Since the Civil War, in which the Southern states were conquered against all historical logic and sound sense, the American people have been in a condition of political and popular decay. 
the beginnings of a great new social order based on the principle of slavery and any and inequality were destroyed by that war and with them also the embryo of a future truly great America. That has been the position of defenders of the Confederacy from Alexander Stevens to Thomas D. Lorenzo. The, uh, the man who said that was Adolf Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any, any, anything you want to say? <clears throat> anything I want to say? Well, uh, I, I knew, I knew he, <clears throat> now I know where Harry's getting his political philosophy. <laughs> well. From okay. the anti-Hitler school? I don't believe anything Hitler says, but if you want to quote him in your book, go right ahead. I look forward done to, it, to yeah. the next one. Okay, way, way in the back. Uh, Professor DiLorenzo, it really bothers me as a libertarian that, that you call yourself a libertarian and then uh, claim to support states' rights. Uh, I think the <laughs> essence of libertarianism is denying that states have any rights. Uh, so I want to know how, how far do you want to take this? Uh, you've spoken in support of states' rights and asserted that peaceful secession and nullification are the only means of returning to a system of government that respects rather than destroys individual liberty. So I want to ask you this question. Uh, now the Confederate States, of course, they seceded to preserve slavery. We know that because the Mississippi Declaration of Secession said that the, our position is thoroughly identified with slavery, the greatest material interest in the world. What I want to know is uh, how far, uh, you, you obviously support uh, secession for slavery, black slavery, but I want to know Suppose a group of one or group of states wanted to secede to establish a society that, say, uh, is based on the ritual kidnapping and raping of nine-year-old white girls. Would you support that as a state's right, or do you draw the line some point between that and Negro slavery? <clears throat> is that a step up or a step down from the Hitler comment? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not sure. Well, on, on the issue, yeah. Well, as I, I mentioned, as I discuss in my book, the Deep South, slavery was the issue. That's when they seceded. And, but the Upper South, uh, when Virginia voted on the secession first, they voted two to one against it. And uh, the Upper South, the Virginia, North Carolina, Arkansas, Tennessee, didn't go out at the same time the Deep South went out. And Lincoln was happy to have them in the Union, slaves and all. And so it's a little more complicated. They, they vote, changed their vote after Lincoln launched an invasion of their sister states. And so uh, I think slavery was a more of an issue. It wasn't a zero issue in the Upper South, but it was more of an issue, like you said, in Mississippi and places like that. So, uh, but I don't think it's accurate to say that it was the sole issue in states like Virginia because they voted to stay in the just Union. Limit, just limit your answer to Mississippi then. Was Mississippi, would Mississippi have been okay to, to succeed to establish a society that, uh, based on the kidnapping and ritual rape and nine-year-old uh, I'm not going to answer crazy hypotheticals like that. I will say if a... Uh, I would say if a state has a right to secede, if a right to secede exists, a right to secede exists, even if slavery was, was, the, was the issue, and we should have diligently worked to get rid of it peacefully. But uh, no, I'm not going to answer crazy hypotheticals, child rape. One, one thing I should mention is both of our speakers are dedicated to the abolitionist idea. They have different ways they think it could be, be best achieved. <laughs> So just to clarify that. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jaffa, uh, recently uh, the online uh, website of the Claremont Institute published a rebuttal article, I think it was called in Ray uh, Kemp versus Lorenzo or something like that. Joe Sobrin, right. Uh, and one of the paragraphs, you likened the union to a contract, and there's lots of ways you could attack that analogy, but I guess the basic question is, can you find any parallel in modern legal terminology where one party to a contract claims the uh, sole uh, right to interpret it and also enforce that interpretation? Well, uh, Lincoln in his July 4th special message to Congress, 1861, said that the people of the South were a law-abiding people and they would not have uh, uh, undertaken to do what they have, were now doing if it, if it hadn't been for the invention of an ingenious sophism according to which a state could secede from the Union without the permission of the Union or of any other state. Uh, 
Now, the, the ratification of the Constitution was, uh, was a action uh, undertaken by all the states which joined the Union and, uh, and adopted the Constitution. And they, that was a contract um, between them and among them that they would abide by the results of the elections conducted under the rules of the Constitution uh, and that they could not act independently of the other states with which they had jointly and severally agreed and contracted to, agree, to, 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 be, to be governed by. I think. Any comment? I have, let, okay. let the one, we have one, time for one more question. Uh, How about the gentleman right there? The gentleman with the purple shirt, probably. He's been trying for a long time. Which one? <laughs> Professor the Jaffa, it seems to me that what it seems to me that your insistence on uh, your insistence on saying that as long as the result, <clears throat> as long as the elections are followed, people are bound to obey them, basically says that as long as procedure is followed, there is no recourse. No matter how unjust a law might be, if procedure is followed, there is no recourse. And I don't think that is consistent with an unalienable right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. In other words, the Constitution doesn't force all men to give up a right that is unalienable. No, on the contrary, the Constitution exists to protect that right. The important point is that the Constitution exists to protect individual liberty, individual property. In fact, the most important of all of the rights, really, the foundation of all rights are the rights to private property. But the right to private property is a right of each individual human being to own himself. Uh, and so the idea of slave property uh, is contradicts the idea of private property. And the Southerners taking their stand on their property rights and their slaves were in fact taking their stand on a principle which was incompatible with the idea of constitutional government. Slavery was in the constitution. So it's an it was a it was a, it was a it was recognized as a as a necessary evil at the time, uh, and the justification for the ratification of the constitution with slavery is that any alternative arrangement would have been more favorable to slavery than the Constitution itself. The Constitution created a government strong enough to deal with the question of slavery when it became what it did become in 1860. And the, the war was a terrible war, but it was a war for human freedom. And, uh, and if the South had succeeded and if slavery had been extended, the, the, we would have, uh, the United States were a part of it might very well have been on the side of Hitler in the Second World War. We would not have been the bastion of freedom we have been in the, in the 20th century. Well, well, Lincoln, of course, when he was elected, was said he, Southern slavery is okay. He promised not to disturb slavery no, where it exists. He did not say it's okay. Where it is, no, where it exists. He, he I said have no he had, attention to... He said he had no legal power to intervene. Slavery where it that exists. He had, that he had no more jurisdiction over slavery in South Carolina than he did of serfdom in Russia. Okay, is, that was the nature of the federal Stay in the Union and pay the tariff and you can keep your slaves is essentially what he was saying. No, that's not true. <laughs> no truth in that, whatever. I want to thank both of our... I want to thank both of our speakers, uh, Harry Jaffa and Tom DiLorenzo. Uh, copies of their books, A New Birth of Freedom and The Real Lincoln, are available upstairs for those of you who have not gotten copies. Uh, both of them would be delighted to autograph copies for you and speak uh, privately as well. Uh, and thank you all for coming and making this such a successful evening. Thank you again and good night. <laughs>